And you can cut, especially if you've made a metric game before, you make this design document and then you just execute it. That's my cuckoo clock. I should have turned that off before, but now you get to, it's not time to write either. So you know that I don't wind my cuckoo clock. <laughs> it's 1136 yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. I need to know when it's 1136 because that's a very important time in Germany. In Germany. Hi, this is Tim Schaefer and this is the history of Double Fine Productions. I had spent the 90s at LucasArts, or LucasFilm Games, as it was called when I started there, right out of college and making adventure games. The first game I ever worked on was Secret of Monkey Island. Well, I was a, a tester, not hired as a tester, but they didn't have any work for us to do. So I tested Indiana Jones, Last Crusade, the action game. And I found this bug where you could jump off the, the name of God tiles and it crashed the game and they all got really mad at me. First real thing I did was, um, it's called Assistant Designer Programmer, or Scumlet on Secret of Monkey Island, Secret of Monkey Island 2. And then I was a co-project leader with Dave Grossman on Day of the Tentacle. And then Full Throttle was the first game I did on my own. And then Grim Fandango and then uh, Quitsville. Quitsville. That's not a game. That's what I did. I quit. Lucas was uh, was going strong. It just said, you know, 10 years is a long time. And I felt like it, it felt like uh, Grim was its own little team inside of, I mean, it was its own team, but it felt like our own little company. Lucas had gotten so big. And he'd gone from the 40 people that were there when I started to this 300, 350 person thing where I just, I didn't know people in the hallways. And I was like, us. Oh. so we left and, and, and some friends of mine were like, we should leave. And they kind of talked me into it. I didn't really want to. I was like, I don't want to worry about getting toilet paper in the bathroom. I don't want to be, I don't want to, I just want to think about games all day. Um, but they talked me into it. Um, and then uh, they didn't end up sticking with it. And so I got stuck with this dumb idea of making a game company. You know, I had this idea for a game about going into people's minds, and I was sitting around my apartment calling up people that I knew and um, not really knowing how to go about it. And then GDC happened, and it was GDC 2000, and they announced the Xbox there. I gave a talk on character design, and uh, in the audience was Ed Freeze, who was running Xbox at the time. And I was like, games are art, and Ed's like, games are art. And then we, we shook hands and uh, started this company signed the first deal the first money we ever had coming in besides my life savings which came and went pretty fast in the first few months was the contract we signed for uh, Psychonauts to be published by Microsoft yep you know I'd had these ideas for interactive dream sequences for years you know famously like during Full Throttle, I wanted there to be this interactive peyote trip where Ben was going to take peyote and then he was going to have this vision and you could be wandering in the desert, kind of like in that Jim Morrison movie, you know, and you'd see the man and the elephant and you'd, you'd, you'd understand something about the world that you didn't know before. Then I was working on a space game. I was going to do this great space game that was going to be like a cross between 2001 and Shaft, kind of like in space, Shaft in space. You were going to find objects and meditate on them and then have an interactive dream sequence and find out clues and, and then and take that as a, a the next leg of your mystery solving thing. I actually was pitching this space game around and someone was like, well, tell me more about that game where you go into other people's minds. And I was like, no, 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 you go into your own mind. It's a meditation. And then I was like, wait, wait, that's better. I like that better. And so I just kind of hung on to that idea in the back of my head for years. And then I uh, started thinking about Psychonauts and where it could be set. I remember watching The Fly 2. Not the fly one, but fly two with like Eric Stoltz, I think, in, there, in this in this research facility for kids who have powers, and um, it was almost going to be set in there. And then uh, I was like, I like summer camp. I like summer camp. You know, earlier on there's some people from the Grim team, and that configuration kind of changed as we got more or less solid. And I started recruiting people from Lucas Arts and Lucasfilm Learning, which was next door to us, and that's where Scott Campbell and Nathan Stapley worked. And Dave Dixon was a programmer that I'd interviewed to hire for my space game at Lucas. Those are some of the first employees we had. Eventually, we got this. So we sublet this clog shop. This was a Spanish couple that was making purses and clogs, which was totally, I guess, not in their landlord's uh, approval. So we got eventually kicked out of there. And uh, we got this warehouse in San Francisco where we, we were until 2003. Mostly I had lived in San Rafael for 10 years and the offices were there. But then right in 1999, I moved down to the city. And that's why I really wanted to start a company in the city because it was, I mean, it was still the first bubble, like the old bubble, the pets.com like bubble, you know. Um, and so then I was like, what was I thinking? But uh, so our first, uh, that unheated, unair conditioned, rat infested sewer backing up warehouse that we got was like, 
four dollars a square foot a month which is crazy back then and then we eventually like the crash happened and then we moved into the place where we're today to this day which is really nice which was like one dollar a square foot and then cheaper and nicer and it was full of air on chairs that some dot-com had abandoned like a like the shell of a hermit crab <laughs> and we were like all right it's like all this all this fancy dot-com stuff was just left there because an entire industry had bloomed and then died so I grew up in Sonoma, which is an hour north of San Francisco. And we drive into San Francisco to see uh, any shows. If we want to see a show. We'd do. And every time we go over the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, there'd be a sign on it that said, slow to 45 miles an hour, double fine zone. And I was like, if we had a band and we called it double fine, people would think we bought this expensive bull billboard on the Golden Gate Bridge. And the, the whole city was a double fine zone. We had like five people. And then we grew and grew and grew. And yeah, I think we got like, it was like a 23% team during the biggest part of it um so not as big as our teams now but it was really like um a really great team like it was really like it came together we had some people that came but we just we couldn't afford anyone we had these interns from the art academy and some and jeff solace is still with us he's one of those original interns and he's been here like uh almost almost a full 20 years you know but uh, we had some of those kids come over and then eventually we could actually pay them and then we hired people like Key and Anna, who are some of our first gameplay programmers, and Kichi and Anna Kipnis, and they came over and started putting the levels together with the, uh, with designers. And we had one producer, we had one person who wasn't a developer, and that was Camilla, who was our everything office manager, producer, like every single every other role was was Camilla. It was still was really fun, but we had no idea what we were doing. And the first time Microsoft reviewed our stuff, it was obvious we had no idea what we were doing because we. Were, I was so used to making PC games and I was so used to making adventure games that, you know, with a real, with a platformer, you have so many a million things to figure out. Like the, 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 which frame you can interrupt when you're turning around and when you're on a ledge and what happens when you skid, like there's a zillion little intersections of different states for the player. And, and it, you spend the entire project just tweaking those million, million things. And we didn't know anything about lighting because we had, you know, 2D artists and really outsider kind of artists who were not technical artists like Scott and Bagel. And then we had programmers and we had no one in between. We did no technical artists, you know, no one like Lee Petty who understands like visuals and tech. We kind of had to throw away our first two years. Like when we were building an engine too, you know, from scratch. And that's always, it's a lot of work. If we had known, we probably wouldn't have done it, but good thing we never knew. Good thing we didn't know. Second got canceled in like 2004, I believe. Ed Freeze left Microsoft and new management came in and we're like, what, what, what are these old Xbox One games? We're getting ready to ship the uh, 360. This they canceled all those games, like seven games. No hard feelings though, because uh, Phil Spencer and I joke about that to this day. <laughs> I think that's why they bought us. They felt bad. They're like, well, we'll help you finish this like nuts. And then we got re-signed. Our agent, uh, Seamus Blackley, got us re-signed with Majesco and we shipped the game in 2005. It's hard to remember how scared I was because I had not really come out as a heavy metal fan back then. I was like adventure game person, pirates, cartoons, Day of the Dead, Psychonauts. Like I felt like I had a certain kind of fan. Like you know, our fans were um, sensitive and and uh, they liked artistic looking things. And I'm like, by the way, heavy metal is really great, and I love heavy metal. <laughs> and it was nice that people like embraced that and they saw it, that it was still just the same approach of being really authentic and true and, and dead like we went deep we didn't we didn't just scratch the surface of heavy metal like we went very very deep yeah! so we made this game about heavy metal i also had this idea ever since i played warcraft not world of warcraft but warcraft the rts game and the herzog's vi on the sega genesis i was like i want to i want to make an rts game but i want to have these demons in it and i had this idea about a roadie who goes back in time and can do anything because he knows how to build anything so we, we got that side with vivendi at the time and then that got canceled. That was our thing back then. Getting canceled was like our hobby. Get your games done quickly is what I learned. I was like, you can't take five years to make a game if you're working with a publisher because no regime lasts more than five years at a publisher. They, they, you know, the regime changes and the new person comes in and is like, I didn't, I didn't sign any of these games. First, I thought, well, this is just my personal little heavy metal story. But um, we're like, well, he's kind of like a Jack Black type. And Vivendi was like, you know, we worked with Jack. Um, no, 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 they worked with. Lemmy. They'd work with Lemmy on um, Scarface. Lemmy was like a, a cameo in Scarface, their game. 
And like, we can, we can get Lemmy. And I was like, no way. And so uh, we got uh, Lemmy and uh, it was the first kind of like rock star that we had in the studio. And that was crazy. He was, he was so nice. And he, they're like, look, just, just set up an ashtray and uh, some makings of like a rum and coke and uh, some Cheez-Its and just turn on the mic and he'll just when he's ready he'll start talking and this is exactly what happened we showed up and he had like a rum and coke and uh and uh started smoking which i can't imagine was legal in los angeles you know vo studios and uh he just started reading the script and we're talking and talking he's like well let's get going then blah 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 and he started just doing the lines <laughs> one take one take of every line and then i was like wow we're done and he's like yeah i'm pretty fast and then he invited me to his house, like to, because we were talking about swords and stuff. It's like, I got some Roman swords back at the apartment. You want to come see it? And so he uh, went back to his house and he showed me his Roman sword collection. In his bedroom, he had a GameCube and it was on and it was playing Star Fox Assault. He loved all air combat games. Do you remember Crimson Skies? He loved dog fighting games. He loved, like, you know, World War II and World War I, like dog, airplane combat stuff. Somehow we got to, I got to have a meeting at the roof of the Four Seasons with Jack, and I showed up with a binder full of concept art. I was like, here's this game, blah, blah, blah. And I, I felt optimistic about it because it was very inspired by the spirit of Tenacious D and Jack in general, where he's just like over the top, you know, because he, he he's a, in a comedy band, but they aren't kidding about the music. Like, it's kind of like Death Clock. It's like the music is seriously heavy and really uh, like the technical um, ability of the musicians is, is really excellent, and, but they're also being funny. And, and the way the heavy metal is like has to have really high le high level of musicianship, but you know heavy metal can also be really ridiculous. Like if you've ever seen a Man of War album cover, or like you know, it, it, it has this, it runs this fine line of it's, you're not making fun of it, but you're you're open to like yeah, it's bigger than life, it's ridiculous, but also rocks. So like, and and you know Jack really embodies that I think with a lot of what he does, and he was he just saw it and he was like okay, I'm in, this is great. And once we had Jack. It felt like the snowball was really rolling, and then we were like, "Well, let's get Ozzy and and uh, uh, Ron Halford from Judas Priest and Lita Ford and all and Lemmy and all these people." Like it just it really started rolling. Well, it started as an RTS game. It started multiplayer, and that's what we did for the first year. We were just making this multiplayer game. Ever since we were with Vivendi, they're like, "We really need to tutorialize this multiplayer thing because it's really complicated, and we do need to expand the single player game," which added a lot of time to the project and led to us getting canceled eventually. But so we kept developing the single player game to be more and more involved, more and more involved. And then Jack came on and it, and it was like, I didn't even notice that it became the game at a certain point. Like, why? Well, when did that action adventure game all of a sudden become the game? And it, it was uh, imperceptible to me that it, when it switched and I still thought of it as like, okay, they're not kind of like these two games, but it was definitely both publishers were like, let's not say RTS except in Germany. It's dead. No one cares about RTS. I was like, what if I, what if someone asks if it's an RTS game? He's like, change the subject just don't you know and by the end of it we were doing like i remember sitting there with um with morgan webb on g4 talking we had a whole episode about the multiplayer and she was like tim you realize this is an rts game like <laughs> she seemed kind of alarmed she's like why, are you, why aren't you talking about this because this is not what i expected and um like i said you know i always thought people would be kind of uh surprised and delighted because i love it i love being surprised i love being a lot of things a lot of people aren't like i like being surprised and confused when i play a game like but you know looking back on it you know our lead designer eric wanted to put more of the uh stage battle stuff into our first demo but it was like we just can't fit it and it doesn't happen early on in the game so where would we you know i wanted to make it optional and we didn't have time to do that like like have have someone handle we had we had the ai for it because we had a skirmish mode but I still love that game and I still play it every October 13th. We get online and we play it with people and spread the achievement, the viral achievement of playing with me. You can still get it. I still love that game. I think if we, you know, tutorialize people in it better, I think a lot of people would have really enjoyed that a lot more. And there are a lot of people who are like, this is the game I've been waiting for my entire life. Uh, so much great, you know, cosplay and tattoos and awesome stuff. So, yep, it definitely has the diehard fans. During Brutal, the important thing to mention here is Amnesia Fortnite because we do this game jam. We, I, was, I was like, everyone's getting sick of heavy metal and I need to take a, take a break, freshen everybody up, and also let um, other people have ideas at the company besides me. So we split the company into four parts, had four teams, and uh, each team made a game. And I get confused with which one was in the first one, but I'm pretty sure what would eventually become Iron Brigade was in that first one, and what would eventually become Once Upon a Monster was in that, or I'm out of order now, but in that first round. Then after Brutal Legend, we did another Amnesia Fortnite uh, game jam, and 
what would become stacking was in that and what would become costume quest was in that so costume quest um was this idea that tasha had she'd had for a long time of just wanting to do an rpg set in the world of halloween and halloween costumes and homemade halloween costumes that would come to life and transform into these fighting characters in the battle mode and that was just her dream i was like that would be a great game so we made that one that was one of the first of the smaller games because you know brutal legend was the entire studio and then we were getting to work on brutal legend 2 and then um ea said psych let's not make that and we're like oh god we're, we're gonna run out of money in like a day uh, but we have these because we've done two of Ninja Fortnites. We had eight demos and we picked our four favorite and we took them all around to get signed. And uh, we signed Costume Quest and Stacking with uh, THQ at the time. And we started making smaller games, which was a big improvement to our studio. Like we just, instead of having this one piston in our engine that would fire every five years, we had these little pistons that boom, 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 boom. we could have an actual uh, rhythm and cadence to our development. It made us much more stable as a company. Yeah, getting back to like a reasonable development time, the longest uh, two years or something like that. And then getting so that other people could have ideas besides me, like big ideas. Like we could have uh, Lee do his games. Yeah, that was the start of a long chain of great games from Lee Petty. You know, and weird ideas like Costume Quest. You wouldn't have to risk the whole company, 60 people for five years on it. You could just uh, put a quarter of the company on it for two years. And or year. I think Costume Quest is actually alarmingly short, like less than a year, really fast. I love the art look. I just love the look of the, the, the costumes. I think the costumes are really still really iconic to me. You know, we eventually made, uh, or um, Federator made a, a, a TV show, a, co a cartoon of it. It's on Amazon Prime. And they still use that robot as, uh, as much as they changed it. That's The robot is still really iconic looking uh, shape. And, the, and they let me write some cutscenes for that. So I got to participate in that game. And that was great because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't leading the project. I could just show up, do some writing, and then bail. It's great, great gig. I mean, Lee was one of those people who was like, you know, during Brutal Legend, it was like, well, this guy, obviously, he's been around for years. I don't want to say he's old, but he's been around for, no, but he's got a lot of experience and he's very, he's a, you know, a kind of a unicorn in that he, he has great artistic sensibilities, but also understands how every pixel makes its journey from the <laughs> computer to the screen. Like he really gets the technical angles of it and also production. Like he gives, I was like, this guy should be running a project, you know? And so he's like, whatever you want to do, Lee. And, um, he had these different ideas that involved masks and creepy visuals. And then one day he's like, wait, 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 Russian dolls. <laughs> and it just seemed so brilliant because it was like, wow, we have one character model in the whole game. Like, it's just one mind. We just put different textures on it. And this is amazing. And um, I, I really love that game. It's uh, it's it's tough because it's an adventure game. Adventure games are like you do a lot of work for like the, you don't leverage it like you do a, a physics based game or something you do like a certain amount of work and you get hours and hours and hours of gameplay out of it but an adventure game you do like it's like this you do this much work for like this many minutes of gameplay so um it still was a lot of work but it has a, a great vibe to it and it's beautiful uh, that was brad muir's game it was uh, a new fortnite project called custodians of the clock because it was all steampunk and i was like it's steampunk is banned at double fine we can't do steampunk because it just felt like such a played out idea back then even then nothing against steampunk don't get mad goggles are we have goggles and psychonauts it's great but um i, I banned steampunk and then um so he's like all right so we'll do this world war one kind of uh thing with the trench and that's when it became like a trench instead of just a mech warrior which is just a funny idea like a, a trench that gets up and walks around it's great the idea of having different project leaders besides me means that we can do things outside of my area of expertise. So having Brad, who was our designer and very mechanics focused designer, do a game that was mechanics first. Like, let's figure out all the gameplay mechanics and forget the story later. So they did all they did this crazy, um, you know, third person shooter with a tower defense mechanic where you fire off these towers and ways and ways of these crazy enemies to come after you then when it was all done they let me write the cutscenes for it they're like okay explain this story <laughs> gotta write some funny uh, cutscenes i i modeled for some of the pictures where the guy's getting crushed by the tank i crawled under my couch and like held up a, a flag under my couch so that was that was iron brigade and then oh then we're about to ship it or we had shipped it and the guy there's a guy on it's still on board game geek you can look up his game called trench it's just a, a kind of a othello like board game and he threatened to sue Microsoft. And they're like, we have to change the name of the game. And and so our programmers wrote a thing. So the game would update 
and it would like uninstall itself, change the ID, do all this magic that had never been done before, never been tested on Xbox ever, and, ch and reinstalled itself under a new name. And I think, to this day, I think it's only the second video game besides uh, Quest for Glory, Hero Quest, an old adventure game from Sierra that changed its name after shipping because of a copyright issue. And there's a board game called Hero Quest, so I bet they're the ones who sued them, but I don't know. I'm just Board game people, man. Board game people are like, we're, they're so bitter about video games, so they're just like, <laughs> sue, sue, sue. There's a prototype that Nathan Marks did called Happy Song, which was like just these little characters who would do these music games with you. And he wanted to do a game about joy. That was his pitch. And then uh, we were pitching it around and we we're like, you know, this would make it, you know, this would, these characters look like Muppets. And it would be so funny if we pitched this as, you know, we're talking to Warner next week and it's, they have the Sesame Street license. What if? And uh, that, I think that was the, the magic to it was that we made it a Sesame Street game. You know, we're very anti license games. We don't do any licenses. But I think that Sesame Street license touched a uh, a youthful part in our brains and we're like oh my god i love sesame street when i was a kid and we got to go to new york and go visit henson studios and i got to touch cookie monster and met elmo and like a, uh i saw big bird and i saw snuffle up i guess anyway i'm gonna go into a four-year-old version of myself if i keep talking but i that was really great because you know henson is like a real special a group of people like they're they're real artists and crafts people and they but mixed in they have the kind of the stagey improviness of Saturday Night live actors but also this craft you know, the sort of Muppets, you know, so they're, they're just wacky theater people and they're really fun to work with. And you saw that the video of me pitching the game to Cookie Monster became a meme. They cut me out of it. But the picture of like Cookie Monster waiting, tapping his fingers is, is from that video we made. Connect had come out and we were doing Once Upon a Monster with uh, Connect. And I liked the technology, but I found it really frustrating. Like I really liked, there was kind of magic to move in front of your screen and have it react to you. But I didn't like all the, you have to sign in and you have to, you log in, you log off. There's all these weird things. If you played the Disneyland game where you'd, if you left the screen, you would come back in and it would like switch your gender on you because it just didn't know who was signing in. It would pick randomly. And I just remember it was tricky and solving those problems was always tricky. And I tried to play Connectables with my daughter, which was a cool game, but I was like, okay, you just have to stand still until it registers you. And she's two, right? She's not going to stand still. Like, stand still and raise your hand. You put your hand up to the left. And uh, so I just wanted to make an experience that there's no signing in. There was no uh, profiles. There was no instructions, no UI at all. And um, that was a tough sell with Microsoft usability. They're very much very like, let's be very deliberate about our user education and like put up pop-ups and stuff. And we're like, no, no pop-ups, nothing. If you haven't seen this game, it's kind of like an augmented reality experience where you, we, sh we use the camera on the Kinect to show you your own living room, which is something kids love. They just love seeing themselves on the screen. And then we do things like fill your living room with lava or like a ball pit or you make pigeons land on your shoulder and they're all reactive they all react to you you know we flood we make it look like you're in an aquarium and fish are coming by and, and to this day when my daughter has a birthday party or something i'll turn it on and kids will jump around in front of that game for hours and hours and hours i never like to pick a favorite project but i do think that was like the proudest i am of ever making a video game just in the in terms of the pure joy you see someone experiencing when they play because you know watching someone play an adventure game is like <sighs> Like you, you don't really see them experiencing joy that much unless they laugh at a joke. But um, watching people play Happy Action Theater and watching like your grandparents and people who don't usually play video games playing it and having fun together, it's just, it could have uh, brought about world peace if more people had bought it. That was our first sequel. It was right after we, we finished Happy Action Theater. Uh, and it was one of those games where like the publishing relationship with Microsoft was still great. We just like, and we loved how the game turned out. Like, let's just do another one. And so it was another interesting technical feat in that the second game, when you installed it, absorbed the old game. So there is no more Happy Action Theater on your machine. It's just Connect Party, but it has all the content of both games. It was like DLC that ate itself, ate its mother. Ron and I, you should ask him about this stuff, but he, he, Ron and I were talking about another project that we were talking about doing together. And we were getting together a pitch for that. And uh, it was seen to be going somewhere with a publisher and then it stopped. And we're like, oh, that's a bummer. And he goes, well, I have this other, I have this other idea about um, 
going down in the cave deeper and deeper with three different players. And I was like, let's do it. And so he came on double fine. And, uh, and that was fun having Ron come back and be around. And, and it was nice to see him back in the action again, because, you know, after Humongous, he had taken some time away from the game industry. So seeing him back and kind of remembering his sense of humor and uh, his puzzle design ideas and stuff and seeing them all come together in that game, which turned out, turned out great. No, he, he was there for the Day of the Tentacle kickoff. Like we started with a document that he wrote about time travel and he was there for the first few brain storming sessions. And then he took off and did Humongous. And Dave went with him. And Dave was on, you know, worked on Pajama Sam and stuff. And I did not work on that game at all. At one point, I rewrote the opening. I was like, hey, here's it. What about this? This is more jokes in it. And Ron didn't use it. So I was like, okay, I don't think he wants me to do any pitch hitting writing on this. But it was our, you know, it was our team. You know, Anna and a lot of the regulars were uh, were on that. And I loved all the different characters. It was so funny. And the uh, time traveling puzzles were great. And um, I mostly just got to test that game, play it, and enjoy it. So that's my ideal scenario. Just in the room next door, a game is getting made that I get to play. Welcome to Dropcord. Dropcord was, uh, at first it was a mobile game. So we these two fellows you might be familiar with, Drew um, Skillman and Patrick Hackett, who later would become Skillman and Hackett, which would be acquired by Google as Tiltbrush. These fine fellows were like our, we call them our future tech department because they did connect party themselves. I did the happy action theater and then I went off to do the broken age stuff or something else. And they were, they pretty much were like all the flashy, you know, the tech and that and all the effects and everything was Drew and Patrick. So then they went on to do this mobile game, uh, drop chord. It was more of a, like a interactive music rhythm. It wasn't a rhythm game, but, uh, uh it was really different than our all our other games because the soundtrack was so different and the style of play was so different. And then uh, Leap Motion came around because, and you know, them being the future tech group, were like, you know, checking out everything VR and Connect was in part of that. And uh, Leap Motion, man, there was a lot of crazy input devices going on that period. Uh, and Leap Motion, for people who don't know, was like it would just you'd hold your fingertips out to the screen and wiggle your fingertips in the air. You still see this in science fiction movies. Everyone almost wants you see someone with VR glasses just wiggling their fingertips in the air, and I'm like, oh, they must have elite motion VR. We originally dropped cord. One more fun fact: it was called Discord. This was because this is years ago, right before Discord that we are speaking on right now. Um, it was called Discord, but like with a short, like ch, like a chord of music. It was a musical pun, and then we got a, a letter from Discord Records, the the label of uh, Minor Threat. And I was like a huge Minor Threat fan. And we had a letter and I had to send like uh, an apology letter to Ian McKay from Minor Threat and be like, hey, I love your music. So we'll change the name of the game, sir. Don't worry about that. He's like, yeah, whatever. Okay, whatever. Video games are stupid. And he uh, he was totally nice. He was super nice, but he's famous for like not licensing his music to anything, including video games and stuff. So. I mean, it was huge. It was huge, a different chapter about us self-publishing and everything, which is a huge step for us. But it started way back when uh, we were approached by this shady documentary crew known as Two Player Productions, who you may be familiar with. You know, you can't documentary people you just can't trust because they're all about manipulating the truth, as you know. So Two Player came and they were doing a documentary on Minecraft, uh, the story of Mo Yang. And uh, they're like, you want to be in our documentary? We want to interview you. I was like, sure. And I was like, I should probably play Minecraft before they come down. And so I, because I hadn't really played Minecraft. And so I played it and I did, uh, and I answered their questions. And I guess they um, developed a huge crush on me because they said, hey, let's make our next documentary about you. Not about me, but about Double Fine. They just thought we were doing creative stuff. And, uh, and so they said, let's do a documentary about making your next game. And I was like, okay. And they were going to kickstart it because they had kickstarted their Minecraft documentary. Uh, what I was worried about is that, you know, publishers don't like you to just tell the truth about your game all the time. They're seen as, you know, documentaries are mostly marketing tools, as you probably have encountered if you've done paid documentary work. They're like, uh, don't don't put in that thing about any cut features or slipping the schedule or, or the team fighting or about anyone uh, getting uh, depression on the project. Don't just leave all that stuff out. Cause why would you put that in a marketing thing? I was like, that's going to be a problem. So we should probably kickstart the game as well so that we could self-publish it. And I thought, you know, we did these Flash games. Like, let's do something like that. Like a little $100,000, uh, $300,000 Flash game. Small team, few, like three months, six people or something like that. And then the rest is history. We launched it and we made $3.3 million uh, off Kickstarter. For, and it changed Kickstarter games for a while. And um, 
it's a big deal. Like we really like, it, you know, and I, I think that was not the only case of this, but there's, it was one of a, a, a change that was going on in the world where kind of gatekeepers were going away that like, like you, you Danny here, no clip, right? You used to do what you do for someone else, right? You used to do this for a gatekeeper who would approve your content and direct your content and, you know, and uh, something has changed in technology and the way that we organize money and, and the internet and fandom to where we can go direct to the people who consume what we make, which is great. For us, that was the moment we got that connection going. And uh, um, and it seemed like at the time it was going to just get bigger and bigger and bigger forever. And that's why we, you know, founded FIG and started doing stuff like that. Because it was like, we're eventually going to crowdfund everything. And then for games, crowdfunding kind of like didn't grow any farther. No one's doing that now. No, Not a lot of people are doing these $5 million, you know, f projects. And um, which is, is interesting. And part of it is just like, it seems like it's not perfectly suited to crowdfunding because like the results are so delayed. Like people are, they we crowdfunded second ounce too, and people are still waiting for it. So you don't get that connection between like I backed it and I got it. Like you know, um, your patrons on NoClip they get immediate rewards, right? You know, so it's it's hard to um, sustain that for games. People have to have a lot of faith. So did that amount of funding as well sort of change the you know scope of the game and everything like that? Oh yeah, it became a real game. We were like, let's make a let's make a a big game out of it and then it got even bigger it got, it got bigger and bigger the best part about it was like we brought in a lot of senior people to work on it like we lee petty worked on it anna kipnis and a lot of you know key and you know we had greg who's just a producer back then a lowly producer and ray and animation and just like it seemed like a collection of uh people who, who were there in the old warehouse like a lot of people who were there in the first warehouse and bagel doing you know the art so it was kind of like uh the old crew um, and that was really fun. It, and it turned out really beautiful and I really liked it. And, and I loved working with, um, got to work with Jack Black again, Elijah Wood did a voice and um, uh, just a really, really fun project. The downside of it was that it happened right during Gamergate. Like it was like <laughs> the intersection of like Gamergate happening when all the distrust of uh, crowdfunding was happening. And just this, like that was, that was one of the roughest times of our history in a way because um, just big contingent of people folks online just came after us they're like we uh we don't trust you you ripped us off you took our money this game's not done massive chalice isn't done you know it's what you know it was a very angry angry time in in the gaming culture and i came out of it blocking eleven thousand people on twitter like i just <laughs> I had, I had to block a lot of people to make you know online social media work for me again you know because it, and then luckily those people got busy moving off to go run the United States government and um, there are people on the team who are like I want to switch to making tools instead of gameplay stuff and I was like why it's like I don't want to face the public anymore like I just I want to make things for people who like them like uh, I want to make tools for artists because they are really happy when they get them as opposed to it, it can be rough but I mean there's so many positive things I think you just you know you know, you can get a skewed view of the world from the internet. You know, you can, you can think that it's all hate, you know, if you spend a day online talking to people, but it's really, those people are not the majority. You know, we go to PAX and there'd be this line of people who just want to come and shake your hand and talk about how what the game meant to them and show you their tattoos of the characters and, and come have a beer with you and stuff like that. That's, that's, the, that's what really people are like, and it's really fun to remember that. I think there's definitely a deliberate statement I've said a few times, which is like, I really want every game to be the complete opposite of whatever we last did. And mostly it came out like that, that thing I said about nine months of thinking about pirates and I never want to think about pirates again. A lot of it is just like, okay, we did that. What else can we do? I mean, I think it's just the way creative minds work. And I think that is the one unifying thing. A lot of our fans are creative people themselves or they they that's what they respond to is creativity and, and being surprised. They like to be surprised and they like seeing someone come up with something they haven't seen before because they like to do that themselves in their own lives and they just value that and so that's the most consistent type of fan we have is the fans of creativity and ideas and i don't like when people are like that, that company's a shooter company they make shooters it's in their dna you know it's like well our dna is to do stuff that we haven't done before <laughs> and so we we like to try new things and so that's why it's kind of weird to be in this position where i've been working on sequels for so long sequels and remasters and reboots and throwbacks and i declare the next game we do is going to be the list of game I work on is going to be definitely original. You know, Justin Bailey was our biz dev guy at the time and he pulled off this crazy deal because it involved Disney who owned the rights. And it, part of it was hearing the news that Disney bought LucasArts. We're like, aha, 
whenever there's a change in regime, there's a change in like how thinking, you know, like it's, let's see if they want to uh, work with us on this. And usually I was trying, always trying to buy the rights back or like get them for free. Hey, you done with those, uh, those adventure games? Can I have those? So we were pursuing them and talking to them. We're like, oh, maybe, maybe. Okay. Nah, well, actually we're talking to someone else about it. And we're like, somebody else? Who would you talk to? About? Who would you? And we were so mad. And then we found out it was Sony. Um, and then we, but we knew the people. So we're like, what are you guys doing? You're ruining it. And they're like, let's all work together. So I was like, whatever, as long as I get to remaster the game. So we got to remaster the games. And I got to go back to Scouter Ranch and go to the archives. And they had found there was a, um, someone from marketing at, at LucasArts had taken it upon himself to become the archivist from LucasArts. And thank God for him because he went and found in a warehouse in Oakland, he found the flat files where all the Lucas Adventure art was on its side. You know, like flat files, it was like <laughs> vertical. And it's right next to a rack of film canisters that say Empire Dailies. We found some of the original like um, audio files that before they had been, been compressed. But we had to find Mr. Plum, our, uh, a friend of our uh, audio team, uh, had a, happened to collect old SCSI drives. Like we needed to find old hard drives that, you know, with different kinds of connectors that just don't, aren't used anymore to get the data off these tapes. And we went re remastered um, uh, the music and then our great, you know, our technical staff, like Oliver, who'd worked on the, the LucasArts remasters of Monkey Island and uh, Brandon Dillon, you know, they, they redid the lighting. So finally, Manny can have like Venetian blinds casting a shadow on his face, like in a real film noir, and his cigarette could light up and cast a shadow. And the class in college that inspired Grim Fandango was this called the Forms of Folklore. Alan Dundee's, Professor Dundee's, talked about gathering folklore. And, uh, you know, that's where we should study the Day of the Dead and learn about f the importance of folklore. It's anyone who wants to be a writer or something should study folklore because it's just important to know these things that people have passed through oral traditions. Um, but he also talked about how museum pieces are worthless unless they have a context to them. Like if you just see a shovel in a museum, you're like, what is that? I have no idea. But if, you know, if you're really doing your work, you find the whole context. Where was this found? Who used it? What was their life like? And all that stuff. So in some ways, those remasters are these not just documents of the games as they existed, but also the context they're made in. So we did all this commentary, brought the team back together. We gathered them, to, uh, all of us together to do commentary. We hung out, we told all the old stories and talked about who we were at the time. And I just think it was so great. It was a great opportunity for us to be able to do that while most of us are still alive and most of us can still remember. And we can actually find like those, those SCSI drives were about to die. Like a lot of that stuff was like last chance to capture it before it poofed into dust. I think what's interesting about it is that I think it would be really um, questionable. Like I always wonder if you pitched it or want to, would pitch that game today because it seems interesting to do a game that now would seem a lot like cultural appropriation, right? I'm going to come in here as this guy who's not from the culture and I'm going to do a game about that culture. I think I would handle a lot different. But the thing I am proud of is that I feel like um, just try to be very true to the folklore and we really did our research and we're very as authentic as we could be and and it made a connection with we got press from uh, like latin communities and people from like uh, mexican and cuban uh, both communities who like wanted to talk about the game and they were just really happy to have that culture represented you know uh, at, at all and we worked with uh, native speakers native spanish speakers like tony plana who played manny and he um he really helped with the dialogue because i would write something like hey buddy and he would be like can i change this to be like a hermano or like you know he put the you know ecole and uh, he had a lot of great uh, phrases that he uh, put a capron, which apparently is much worse in Spanish than Cuban. So, you know, he, you know, working with people who actually know the culture, I think, yeah, was really important. So I feel like, you know, we've gone down to Latin America to do a game conference or something. Just tons of people who really felt that that game meant a lot to them. And they, they really loved seeing their culture in it. And they weren't the fact that they weren't mad at me for using that culture meant that I felt like we had done it authentically and with a good in good faith death is always this kind of phantom like in dickens you know it would be like this kind of creepy phantom who's coming for you and um and death in in mexican folklore was always more just this uh like this natural part of life like this like it happens you know what i mean and he in some ways was a social equalizer because he took came for the rich came for the poor and this attitude of like remembering um your loved ones once a year and putting up this ofrenda and having them inviting them into your house once a year to visit and you know it was just very uh felt very healthy and, and warm and I really liked it. Full Throttle was a real technical challenge because we had the, we started using 3D for the first time in that game. Mostly the, the bikes and the vehicles were all rendered in 3D and then painted over by a 2D artist. But so we get the, so we get the rotations just like oh can you get a rotation of the vehicle. 
Um, but also we used um, Vince Lee uh, had made Rebel Assault. You know Rebel Assault? So you're shooting down a trench because we had CDs, which had, as far as we were concerned, unlimited storage, finally. So we can just render going down a trench and then put it on the disc and like, oh my God, who cares about data anymore? So um, he had made that game and we're like, we're going to use that for our biker game. We're going to have it be a road though. So we made like a low flying trench. And uh, so, you know, that stuff is what probably didn't, you know, age well. Like the 2D stuff aged fine, but the uh, all the 3D stuff, we uh, kind of had to remake it all in 3D and stuff. Suddenly, Petty Loose on the World again. He uh, wanted to pitch a game. Was that after? That was after Broken Age. And he was like, oh, What if this game you could have your head fly off your body and fly around? And I was like, I just would immediately thought of Futurama. And I was like, Oh, it just sounds like a skit from Futurama. And then he's like, No, no, no. And then he showed me a storyboard of this puzzle where you shot a guard, shot his head off, launched your head, and then took over his uh, robot's body and walked around. And I was like, Oh my God, that's brilliant. There's just so many puzzles you could do with that. And, uh, and then he had this art style that I was like, oh, that looks a lot like that spy game I was going to do, a Shaft in Space. It looks like you're going to steal all my art reference. And t-. But it was so well, um, that world is so beautifully envisioned as far as art direction goes, just that that capturing that um, aesthetic of, of kind of pre-Star Wars 70s sci-fi, you know, like before, like Logan's Run era sci-fi, because Star Wars changed everything. And it was like, we got to get gritty and realistic in space. But before then, everything was like, you know, it's gold and silver and space robes and a whole different take on things. So I thought it, it was a really fun game and it really uh, captured that look. And has a great soundtrack by Dave Earl. We were, we were thinking like, we got to do a, we should try a VR project. Everyone's doing VR. We got to get some of that VR money that's floating around. We're like, what could we do? And uh, someone's like, what if you, Chad? Dawson it was like what if you're in the back seat of a car on a road trip and your parents are driving and you're but the idea of like being stuck in a seated in a chair because I get really sick when I do VR if I move at all I get sick for hours and uh at least in the early days but um like okay you're sitting in a chair and then eventually you're like you know if we're gonna try something new let's just use psychonauts and we came up with this whole plot you know there's this stuff we want to tell about um what happened to Raz when he went to rescue Truman Sonato. So it came with a whole plot about why Raz would be tied in a chair and how he could use clairvoyance to leave his body. And um, we had a really interesting mechanic where you could jump from head to head around an environment and look at different people's points of view in order to solve puzzles and use your... And it's a really important story link between Psychonauts 1 and 2. So I people, hope people find a way to play it. It's on uh, all VR platforms. So after Headlander, uh, Lee had kind of done the 70s, and then he was getting into the 80s with Rad, and uh, and he had this crazy idea of doing a roguelike, um, which is not like something I have a lot of experience with. Like I love Loot Rascals, and I play a little Spelunky, but I'm very intimidated by uh, roguelikes. He was ready to take it on, and so he made this crazy um, a game that was uh, not just about the 80s, but about a certain tone of certain films like Night uh, of the Comet. You know, there was this 80s apocalyptic uh, world, which is so different than like The Walking Dead or apocalyptic visions today. It's like a, a lot more a lot more neon, and I think the attitude about uh, survivors and stuff was really different, and so I think he captured that tone really well with his, his, uh, his game, Rad, which I still haven't beaten. You know, we I wasn't going to make Second so I had ideas for it. I had this like Google Doc open with like, level ideas and story idea. I had these story things that I was kind of foreshadowing the first game. Uh, but then I was like, I'm never going to do a sequel. And so uh, kind of moved on from it. And, uh, you know, there's a thing famously, right, the same day we launched that crazy Kickstarter that took over, the news that like the, the night before that was going to be the big news was that Marcus from Minecraft days, you know, Notch was like, hey, let's just make Psychonauts too. And, and everyone was talking about that until the Kickstarter took off and then no one was talking about that anymore. Uh, that, and we actually talked to him and he's like, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, okay, here's the budget. And he goes, oh, ooh, this is more expensive than I thought it was going to be. And then he was like, let's do it. And then he was like, no, nah, let's not do it. Let's do it. Let's not. And it went back and forth. And then it was like, and then he went off to um, go on his new adventure of being kind of an interesting eccentric character on the internet. But it's I put this idea in my head of like, you know, we could make that game. You know, all those ideas could really pay off. You know, that would be really fun to, you know, in a way, uh, you kind of brewed. And, and then we were talking about, you know, starting FIG, which was our crowdfunding 
platform that was going to let people share in the profits of the games that they backed and uh we kind of launched them together it, it took off and we had a we had once again we had a publisher at the beginning and then they uh, kind of vanished and we got new publishers and then they kind of vanished into the world of swedish law and then we got acquired by microsoft who it's helping us you know finish this game in style which is nice a ton of people were um asking us for advice like could you look at my kickstarter can you look at my can you tell us what to do on our kickstarter and i was just like keep the videos under four minutes and don't do physical rewards it's fine but, but greg was giving me a lot of advice you know and and we we're trying to help people realize that you know we're not a company that has a ton of money but we do have a lot of experience and a lot of connections and we you know we know who to call at all the platforms to get a meeting you know and we know how to do community and and publishing type stuff and uh we kind of took all that free advice and we turned it into Double, Double Vine Presents, which was a publishing branch where we'd find games that we really liked that just needed a little, maybe they didn't need a ton of money, but they needed just some guidance, helpful, you know. The very first one we did was a Scapegoat 2 with Ian Stalker, which is a great, great game. That's I did beat that game. That was a fun game to play all the way through. And then early on, we were lucky enough to encounter the Gang Beasts fellows, the Brown brothers over there in England. And... Um, they just needed a, like a small amount of funds to hire an artist or something. And, and those they just wanted a lot of advice about, about stuff. And we hooked up with them and their game was hugely successful. Like a very, very successful and well-deserved, like a really great game, really funny game, really great small team working on it. And um, it's like, it was always such a crowd pleaser at shows. We'd have our PAX booth and there'd be this huge crowd playing Gang Beasts. And we'd have, uh, we made wrestling belts and had a big ring, you know, Greg and Spafford wear rest referee shirts and they would, you know, have these tournaments and um, it was so fun. And we did that. And then we worked with David O'Reilly, uh, one of your countrymen on uh, uh, everything and mountain. And, uh, and then, you know, we also worked with the yeah, most recent one was Knights and Bikes. You know, if you, it's uh, an awesome co-op game by Rex and Moo. The people who made kids. I think I don't want to leave. Now I'm going to I'm going to leave someone out. I think there's someone. Oh, no. Yeah, the co-op. <laughs> yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, Samurai Gun 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have. Uh, yeah, and our thing is kind of like. Um, remember the movie 24 Hour Party, people? Did you ever see that? <laughs> it's fun. Uh, the record executive who signs. Um, Joy Division. It's kind of like the, the the deal is on a napkin. And he's like, if you guys ever get sick of this, just walk away. What do we want to do? That's kind of like that's kind of like our deal. It's kind of like we're not really trying to lock these people in and uh, make a bunch of money off of them and stuff. We just uh, we're trying to help out, you know, lend what we can as far as expertise and connections to these people until they don't need it anymore, and then they move on. Let them fly away. We've had many different modes of operating. We've had regular publisher contracts. We've done a lot of self-publishing. You know, we've been in completely independent. We've done half and half. And we we're talking about getting some investment because there was some investment money flying around. And, and we were like, you know, we could use some of that to finish Psychonauts. And so we were talking to different investment groups and, and um, different companies. And we approached uh, our friends at Microsoft and we we're like, do you guys do investment? They're like, ah, we don't really do that investment thing, but we do this thing where we just uh, gobble you up completely one bite and we're like ah oh, it's not really what we're looking for but let's talk about it but you know we have our own culture and we like to make the kind of games we want to make we don't really want to change and matt booty uh started talking about limited integration studios the way ever since they acquired moyang they feel like they've learned their lessons about acquiring companies and they've learned a, a, a light touch way to do it where you don't alter the company you just you just support them help them be the best version of themselves but don't change them and i was like i don't believe that, no, believe that. so i called up but okay i could call up brian fargo and fergus uh or what and talk about what had happened with obsidian and with in exile and they're like oh no they mean it they're seriously they just leave us alone they just helped us you know we can pay the rent now and we don't have to worry about pitching all the time and we can just make our games they want to have us keep our culture. We don't have to, I was like, do we have to pay, uh, hang a big Microsoft logo in the lobby and change my email to be Tim at Microsoft? And they're like, nope, nope, we don't want to change any of that stuff. We just want you to make great games. And they talked about Game Pass. And I started to understand the appeal of like having a lot of, getting a variety of developers making content for Game Pass and started to seeing the future a little bit. I'm bad at seeing the future, but like these subscription services are the way of the future, I think. And they're going to keep coming and there's going to be, I'm not entirely sure how indie developers make money off of them, but um, this seemed like a, a smart place to be because I like I like Microsoft's plan for Game Pass. I think they are really 
uh, doing it right. And uh, it seemed like an opportunity to be part of something in the same way that, you know, Netflix has been. And so it was a really positive. They they funded a lot of new content. A lot of TV shows wouldn't exist if it wasn't for that. And so I wanted to be on that side of it. I wanted to be on the original content being funded by the streaming service instead of the victim of this, you know, being steamrolled by a streaming service as they ate all the money in the world. tell you a story <laughs> um they when they were shipping monkey island they had uh, promised retailers a certain amount by a certain date and they didn't realize the manufacturing plant would have a strike or something some something really bad happened and everyone left i hope it wasn't a strike because that would make us scabs but then um so management came to us all and we're like oh and they're like hey guess what fun field trip we're all gonna go down to this warehouse don't ask any questions and we're going to work. So they, you know, if we want to make our, if we want to make these deals and live up to these marketing promo things we've done, we've got to ship a bunch of games right now. So they take uh, the dev team. Like we all went down to this warehouse in San Rafael and we assembled boxes. Like we stood on the assembly line. We put the manuals in the boxes and we sh put them through the shrink wrap machine and all of it. We just sat there, me and Ron Gilbert and Dave and the, oh, the whole team marketing, everyone was there. And it was actually, it was a really fun field trip. Like I feel like how often in, Game development do you get to make the physical thing that you're going to send to people there was one box that ron put a dollar bill in he took out the grossest dirtiest dollar bill in his wallet and we i don't know if we signed it we might have all signed it and he, he dropped it in one of the boxes and we never heard of it from anybody so it's probably still shrink wrapped on some collector's shelf he doesn't even know